Come in, come in, welcome. What's that? No, no, you haven't missed anything. They're just about to start. Buffalo sports, of course. Everything, bills, sabers, buttes, bad... No, it's not very... Well, they certainly think they're funny. Listen, let me pour you a drink. Have a seat and lend an ear. You'll hear tales of sorrow and despair, endless droughts and infamous tanks, and things Mike doesn't like. Please, join us. I think we're all searching for answers after yesterday's Bills game. Uh, so I'd like to start off this podcast by asking you all some questions uh, to test how we feel at this point in the season. Uh, number one, out of all the teams in the NFL, what two teams lead the NFL in cumulative passing yards? The Kansas City Chiefs mm-hmm. and the New Orleans Saints. And what is the uh, the combined record? Did I get that? I don't actually know. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was trivia. Not hey, guys, let me fine. start the show because I got a big thing. A big thing? I got a big thing. I'm a bobber. Is this live? Yeah, it's live. Oh, good. Totally Let's live. do it. All right, Jeff. Three, two, one. All right, guys. So <laughs> following the the debacle yesterday, I think we're all searching for some uh, some answers. I'm still mad. I'm searching for answers. No, I was like, the Chiefs, you're like, yep, you'll, and well, who else? I'm like, the well, Saints. Well, no, because the Chiefs is, the Chiefs is 100% correct. Yeah. The Saints is not. Okay. But for the sake of this argument... So the Chiefs are currently passing leader number one is Patrick Mahomes of Kansas City. Number two is Kirk Cousins of the Minnesota Mm. Vikings. Um, Drew Brees, surprisingly, is 12th. But you look at the top top 10 to top 15 teams even in the league, and you look at what they have in common in all of those teams in this day and age, the successful teams at the top of their divisions, the top of their conferences, are passing-oriented football teams. And out of curiosity, uh, how many touchdown passes does Josh Allen have so far this season? Three? Two. 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 He has two. Patrick Mahomes threw for four yesterday. Mm-hmm. Isn't he somewhere near 20 right now or He's 25? 21 through his first game. Just the, and yet today on the record, Sean McDermott goes on the record and says, you know, scoring 50 points would be great. 50 points makes it a lot easier for my football team. But, you know, we're in Buffalo. This is a run climate. We're going to run the ball. And I think he should just be fired on the spot for even thinking that for a goddamn second. May I read the exact quote? Oh, yeah, please. From our friends at, uh, our friends and colleagues over at WGR. We'll do this. Then we'll talk about hockey. We're going to talk Sabres. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do yeah. Bills at this the is end. all I got. McDermott, I'd love to score 50 points. That'd allow me to sleep a lot easier. Balance is key, but you want to be able to attack the weaknesses of the defense. Where we live in Buffalo, you want to be able to be physical. And run the football. Who's this? Uh, that is Aaron Rodgers. Who dat? Tom Brady. And who dat? That is Peyton Manning. Okay. Where were they playing <laughs> these games in? Uh, cold weather climates. Green Bay, Wisconsin. Foxborough, Massachusetts. And Denver, Denver Colorado. Colorado. Guess what? It snows a lot in those cities. Mm-hmm. And guess what other? You've got Chicago building around a franchise quarterback. You've got Pittsburgh. Big Ben throws all over. Roethlisberger. Philadelphia around Carson Wentz. This is not a running league anymore. And I don't think this team deserves a second of your attention in its present state. It is an absolute embarrassment to the sport of professional football that they think that anyone who is a thinking football fan should take them seriously. Patriots next week. Great. On Monday night. So anyway, enough about that. Um, Let's talk some Sabres, guys. Because there is something exciting going on in Buffalo sports. And there's a winning team. There's a winning team. For the first time in a week, the Buffalo Sabres have we did a it. winning record. We got there. There were three-day-old babies who had never seen the Buffalo Sabres have a winning record. And I'm thankful for their sake that we were able to correct this grave evil. So they opened their eyes leaving the hospital. They know that the blue and gold has led them <laughs> to a winning record. <laughs> They're in the wild card spot. In the East, they play in the much tougher division, and they're not getting trucked right now. Everything is coming up. So what is it? F- five of their next seven are Montreal, the Rangers, and Ottawa, or something. Vancouver, yeah, I Vancouver. Is in there as well. Regardless, so like they can, they could 
pot five of these next seven just by beating teams that they're supposed to. Now, Justin, you like Fortnite. What do you think about the Canucks plan? Well, when they come to Buffalo, they will have not played Fortnite for over a week. Wow. I checked their schedule. Yeah. So they're going to have that going for them. A Pretty slight cool. advantage. No video games. It's like a good cleanse. <laughs> good, nice cleanse. <laughs> Who can focus on video games when you can focus on Bo Horvat <laughs> and all the other um, hey, they Brock Bowser, Brock and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, Sven yeah. Barshi, and they got some uh, Tim Schaller, Daniel uh, Sedin, Goldobin, Peterson's out, Roberto Luongo, Patterson, Marcus Nassel, Mike Madison killed him, Pavel yeah. Bure. Anyway, uh, let's talk about the Sabres road trip. So, since the last time we were here on the air with you, the Sabres have played four games which they split, and I feel like the confidence in the room when we asked how we wanted them to do in this week, we settled on a split or better. And it was certainly looking a little skewed early on in that trip, and I think right around Thursday in the second period of that San Jose game, we were like, yeah, all right, this is disappointing. And San Jose's a really good team, but still you want to you want to show some signs of life. There weren't tons of signs of life against Vegas. There were basically no signs of life against San Jose. But, man, that was a awakening in the L.A. game and the, the latter half of yesterday, I feel like yesterday's game against Anaheim is a game that the Sabres of old would have lost going away and never had any fight in. But I got to give this team credit. They got behind in a building that was amped up for their team, a team that was amped up to play for the mana raising for Paul Correa, and they did not go away. They just kept hacking at it. I think you guys, were Steve and Justin, you were both talking about it earlier in the game. It felt like the Sabres had sustained periods of the game where they would have two minutes of possession, get nothing out of it, and I went right back down the ice and immediately scored. And I was going to say that it's very easy to get, to, to get demoralized in that situation. And they fought, they fought through it, they fought hard, and they came back and scored four and answered, four nice unanswered goals. They did. I I want to. <laughs> Justin and I have been looking forward to tonight, and it's much less eventful because the Sabers have won their last two. Um, I've been with my <laughs> wife for fifteen years, and we've been married for seven, and we don't argue. We really don't. Honest. Justin and I have been bitching at each other for <laughs> like a week and a half because when they lose. I get all upset, and Justin always has an excuse. Now, I am all for giving them an excuse when they lose, except for when it's three out of six games. And I went to the point where I said, oh, after the San Jose game, oh, when they lose to L.A., it's going to be that quickest back. And when they lose to Anaheim, it's going to be because they're a good team and they retired Paul Correa's number. At some point, you have to beat a good team. In the NHL, it happens every night that a bad team beats a good team or a team beats a team that is better than them. It happens all the time. And it felt like at first the Sabres were beating the worst teams and getting trounced by the good teams. And that obviously my argument is, is much more deflated after that Anaheim game yesterday. LA is not a good team. They don't look good at all, but Anaheim's a great team and they, they put up 45 shots and kick their butts. First of all, I never would have dropped those two shitty excuses. That you pointed out. Well, that was just I me. Only was that was just you. me making an argument that you would only, make an excuse for every game. I was game. only getting after you because you were going bananas over the Vegas game, like they're about to go three and seventy nine. But that we'll get back into that later. Let's talk about. <laughs> so there was a lot of highlights from the weekend, and I think the the top of my list personally, and I don't know if it's the top for everyone, is. Man, after this weekend, it really feels like we fleece Carolina in that Jeff Skinner trade. Ooh, ooh. And I know he's a streaky scorer. He's always been a streaky scorer. He's going to go through these phases where he gets seven goals in four games, and he's going to go through stretches where he doesn't score for eight games. But it's been a while since we've had a guy who can play on that top line with Jack, who you trust is going to finish more often than he misses those golden chances. And he had just an amazing weekend. Um, how I, I don't actually know how long it's been, but it feels like it's been forever since a Sabre who is not Jack Eichel had a hat trick in a hockey game. There was it Thomas like Vanek before ages. that. Yeah, there was Thomas Vanek before that, which we're talking in the late 2000s. And then he has that good goal yesterday, and just I feel very confident that he and Jack, the more they play together, the better that that's going to look because that one breakout pass from Jack just yesterday say, on that smokes. first goal against Anaheim was just an absolute thing of beauty. I peed a little bit because that was a no-look, like... That's a no-look pass that has like a 5% chance of even getting to where it's supposed to go. And then it's it's picked up perfectly on the fly with by Pominville. We talk about their lack of speed through the neutral zone. Pominville and Skinner were, were cooking as if they knew that pass was coming. They broke out. Jack was, was skating up the half wall just trying to make a play on that puck. And Pominville and Skinner jailbroke out of the zone like they knew it was coming. And I don't know if they heard Jack say go, go, or what it was, or they just kind of had a hunch, or they knew the puck was coming out. But if you watch the play, Jack's not the first player to that puck either. I don't know who it was, but the Ducks player is the first one there. Jack wins the battle in an instant, 
Great. sets off Palmerville and Skinner on a two on freaking gorgeous. Absolutely beautiful. Those plays those plays remind me of when the Sabres were good, quote unquote. That sure. they could finish on yeah. an odd man rush. That's that's just, that they could develop an odd pass. man rush and that they can finish on it. And Skinner, and it's not just Skinner and Eichel on that play. That's a great feat by Pominville. Yeah. If, you, if you want to play that back, well, you're going to get it back here one more time. But just Jack knowing where his wingers are going to be, I feel like a lot of the reasons that Jack has struggled to facilitate as many plays as he has in previous seasons is because he doesn't have any confidence or trust in his wingers to get to the parts of the ice where he feels that they should be. But he's shown in past seasons he's got at least a passing amount of confidence in Pominville. And now with Skinner and just that pass, he he trusts that Pommelville's going to be there. If he makes that back pass to the neutral ice and there's nobody there, that's a turnover. That's an odd man rush the other way for Anaheim, quick and easy. But just confidence for Jack, who's a point per game player so far this season, and just the the, the narrative on Jack has turned around real quick. I remember this watching NHL Network the uh, the night of the Sabres opening loss to Boston. And everyone on every major network and a lot of people on the internet were talking about, man, I don't think Jack really back-checked on that shower goal. Is he ready to wear the C? And I think we just got to realize that all this stuff happens by itself, and we just got to sometimes just take a step back and realize that he's having a good season. And and that's something that's been just out of control. This entire road trip has been the narrative. Arizona was the game that everybody expected to win. Great, you did it. Um, Sabres after dark lost its mind collectively understandably vegas and san jose they were disappointing performances but look (laughs) you you can't do this after every game this is a marathon not a sprint stop coming at my life going to well i'm just (laughs) telling you that i'm trying to make you a happier boy and if you're going to lose your mind after every single performance after every single period it's like I said before, you can't boo them if they're going to get if they give up two goals at home at, at the end of the first period. Like I understand a sucky performance, but at some point like it's an 82 game season and I just I I don't think that the the f- the fury that people have over individual performances it, it's not healthy to have that be sustained over the course of 82 games. It's just not like my frustration. They're going to play crappy sometimes. My frustration is when they when they've lost this year, they have looked every one abysmal. of their games is non-competitive essentially. Yesterday Except was. For yesterday. Oh, yesterday, yesterday was. 100%. Yesterday was the first competitive game. I know the Rangers game was three one to Buffalo, but it, the Ranger the, the Sabres well, dominated going that game. Away, yeah. Not sh- not in shots on goal, but they dominated. But the play. they dominated the play of that. Every yep. other game has been either the Sabres are murdering their opponent or getting murdered. They can't. Right? Even, I get frustrated when they can't even complete a breakout pass or get through the neutral zone. I don't need them to win every game, but in games, the San Jose game, they give up the two goals because Oposo takes that dumb penalty. But they struggled to make a pass in that game, and that's when it I, drives me. And I get me that, nuts. but there's going to be games where they're down to nothing and they end up you know winning in the third period or losing in a shootout or whatever and you can't there's almost you're you're going to overanalyze and drive yourself crazy if every single you know if if they can't hit a breakaway or if somebody misses a rotation on the defensive end like it's it's gonna happen yeah and you it's not if jack eichel doesn't back check on a on one shift that's not an indictment that he shouldn't be the captain or doesn't deserve his contract. And that's where we're at right now. Well, my frustration came for, from three of the first six games they came out flat. You said sometimes they're going to look like that. Sometimes they're going to struggle. And I understand in an 82-game season that's going to happen. But when three out of six games, they looked like they did not know how to play professional hockey from pretty much start to finish. They, they didn't score. Like the Vegas game, the goal came with – 30 seconds to go like it was a meaningless goal boston they did not score at all colorado they were never in that game like and my frustrations came the fact that that was i understand in an 82 game season if that happens one out of every five games or whatever you're playing three and four nights whatever they look that way three of their first six games and that's why i was nervous so i think prior to the game against anaheim you had eight games four and four Mm -hmm. and i feel like in those games which they lost they got off to a bad start and at no point during the game did they ever do anything to recover from mm-hmm. that. Like, the other team got ahead of them. They stayed ahead of them. They just pounded them into the ice. The games where they got off on a good foot, even if maybe they didn't score right away or even score first in one case, at least they were, they were, they were feeling well. They played well together. They were making good passes. But they at no point, like, had any sort of comeback in mm-hmm. them. And that's why I'm 
after I feel a lot better about this team after yesterday's game because that was an easy game to lose. A tough road game back to back at a team raising a banner in their building for a le- honorary player. And then it's, you go down two. And you go down two goals and they just didn't do it. They they had stick to itiveness yesterday and it felt really good that that team exhibited the signs that they showed it, yesterday. It, it's just such an odd schedule though to be so front loaded with Western Conference yeah. teams. I mean Seven of your first nine games are out of conference. We're, we're not seeing points. Vegas again until the Stanley Cup. Right, can, I, exactly. can I be objective? Trying with to get free points at this point. The objective about the Anaheim game, and I'm certainly happy that they came back, but back-to-back, Buffalo plays in L.A. at, you know, 2 o'clock or 5 o'clock. Or, th- three, th- 3 Eastern, noon Pacific. Correct. So, right. it's very odd. so they finish that game at, we'll just stick to Eastern time, they finish that game at 6 o'clock Eastern. And then they go to their hotel. They travel all the way to Anaheim, jokingly, tongue in cheek. Not twenty-seven far. miles. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Anaheim played in Vegas the night before, so Anaheim Wait. played two games in sixteen hours. Buffalo played two games in twenty-eight. So when you talk about the comeback, it could be that Anaheim's legs might have been a little bit shot from playing twice in less than twenty-four hours. Which a flight from McCarran to Orange County is only about forty-five minutes. But... Yeah, but you're still. They still had less time. I mean, by the time they get on the plane, what time was it? You know, Buffalo's sitting in their hotel probably by 8 o'clock that night, 9 o'clock. True. And, and Anaheim probably gets on the plane at midnight, you know, and then gets into... So I'm certainly not discrediting that comeback, but there's definitely... That's a factor to me that Anaheim had played 12 hours prior. But just a different yeah, back-to-back and, 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 for Anaheim yeah, maybe, as Buffalo. Maybe their legs are tired and then you get a, get on them a little bit more in the second mm-hmm. period, but it, felt it wasn't like way. Anaheim gave it to Buffalo. No. It really felt like Buffalo went and took that game and... I mean, not just to come back and tie it, but to just win it going away. I mean, and from and to the very end of, the, of that game, that's a big scramble in the goal, trying to defend with the extra skater out for Anaheim. Hut makes a big save. There's a big clear off the line by Larson. That's our weekly Johan Larson shout out. <laughs> he, made, he made a couple good plays. Friend of the pod, Johan Larson. Oh, great interview mm-hmm. last week. Yes. I, I heard it. Uh, it's just a real honor to be able to are, continue that tradition here. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Did you guys notice the changes to Power Play 1? Significant changes. It felt like it flowed a lot better. Yeah, but Dalin for Rasmus Ristolainen and Middlestad for Oposo, and that was not just a one-time thing. That's their new power play now is Jack, um, Dalin, Middlestad, Reinhardt, and Shiri or Skinner. Nice to see that Middlestad's already out of jail after everybody yeah. thought that he was a bust <laughs> after two games. And he's looked pretty good. I know. That unit I think looked that pretty Dali good. Moves, that Dalin move is permanent on that, on that power play, I think. And it, I, People have been upset with Ristolainen, and I have not. I thought he's played pretty well. I so think he's far. been fine. He's, he scored yesterday, but that's that's not why he's played okay. But um, Dalin looks really good at the point of the power play, and his puck moving ability is better than Risto's. I feel like people nitpick Risto's plus minus a little bit, but if you ask them what their opinion of Connor Sherry is, they'd be very high, even though Sherry's plus minus is worse than mm-hmm. Risto's. It's all relative, and it's so early in the season to be kind of nitpicking those stats like Ignore that. Ignore plus like, minus. Like and Je- Risto's no longer with Scandella. Jeff either. Skinner's a plus eight apparently. Yes, it's fascinating. And that's um, why we Risto's are. no longer a uh, with par- partnered with Scandella. Right. Oh. And that's another adjustment is getting used to a new defensive partner and new assignments. And Justin shared in our, our group Slack earlier this week the, the shot chart of what it looks like when Rasmus Ristolainen is on the ice. But all of the shots and chances, not all of them, but the majority of them are, are coming from the yeah. other side mm-hmm. of the ice where he's not because everyone is attacking whoever he is paired with mm-hmm. versus attacking Risto. So it appears to be possibly a case where it's just finding the right guy to defend with Ristolainen versus Ristolainen being the problem because other teams are looking at the Sabres defense and being like, all right, Let's not pick on 55. Let's pick on six or whoever else is across from him. Or 82 or four. Or Listen, Julio has been a healthy scratch. Even though he scored three games ago, he's been a healthy scratch the last two games, and I am okay with that. He would be in Rochester if not for the, the roster issues because he has to clear waivers. Gooley did not. Pilot did not. So they sent them down. But I think Julio would, would – not. I think there's a 0% chance he'd be up here playing if he if he was not on a one-way contract. They don't how, want to lose him for nothing. How long into the season do you think they can keep both Pilot and Gooley down if they are performing well in Rochester? Someone's going to get hurt. Bogosian will probably be broken tomorrow. Bogosian, he's been Bogosian good. Bogosian got hurt because he mentioned his name. He's been good, though, and he's been fighting. All three games he's gotten in a scrap. I was going to say, I, I've, people hate Zach Bogosian because he's brittle. The games that he's been out he's there, good. he's producing. He's I'm good. just saying good. he's done fine. For what he's been he, doing. He's blocking shots like crazy. He scored the other night. He is certainly playing the physical. Who'd they take a run at? Middlestat? And Bogosian was not having it. He went over and dropped the gloves and started swinging. 
All three games, the last three games, he was chucking knuckles, and I like it. I guess so. Nine games into the season, who is the saber that you are the most impressed with, or someone who has really played a lot better than you expected them to play in the early part of the season? And we've mentioned a couple names in passing, but I'm curious who really stood out to you guys individually. Well, it sounds stupid, but uh, Jack Eichel has exceeded all expectations so far this season, as far as I'm concerned. He is finally that player that everybody imagined that he can be. He's on pace. For 82 points in 82 games, he's helping out. He's taking shots. You know, shooting percentage isn't great, but it's fine. Eight percent is actually still pretty solid, I guess. And mm-hmm. yeah, he's been the, he's been the guy that um, that everybody dreamed that he would be, and he has taken the leadership role on this team. Nine points in nine games to me, you know, I, the defensive lags they're going to be there occasionally. Still, don't forget he's still a kid, yeah. basically. Well, remember the narrative 21. about Alex Ovechkin for the longest time was that he was a great scorer who couldn't give less of a shit about his defense. Right, and, and I think he that still found a way to have a good career. Right, and I think that that's just something that it, there seems, for whatever reason, there's a tendency for defensive ability to come a little bit later in life, and it's just learning where you need to be, making sure that you're making the right plays. Otherwise, I would say Eichel's been he's been the best player on the team so far, so I think he's exceeded expectation. Uh, I was worried Connor Sheary was a product of playing with um, Sidney Crosby, and it doesn't appear to be that way. Justin, I don't mean to steal your thunder, but you talk about how Skinner and Sheary play hard every shift. And Sheary, in that Boston game when the Sabres just fell flat on their face, the, the amount of speed he played with, his ability to skate quickly, to, to make a quick decision, to chip a puck and go get it, and he's little. He's out there scrapping. He, yep. I mean, he's like Nathan Gerby, but with more talent. And I like Gerby, don't get me wrong. But he looks like a little – he's a scrapper out there. So I'm pleasantly surprised by Shiri. I think that a lot of people had high expectations for him. And I was nervous that they'd be let down because of – when you play with probably the greatest player in the world, you're going to have numbers. Um, and although his numbers are not fantastic right now, they're they're good. He's looked good. I don't think Shiri's had a bad game. Yeah, I think there's a value on a guy like Connor Shiri who is just going to load up a cannon and let fire every time the center – hands in the puck and he's got three goals and all three of them he just put every single pound on his body into it and i feel like that's going to get him a lot of goals playing with guys like jack mike see i'm most impressed by uh Darlene just by just based on the fact he's 18 years old and he looks like a veteran out there it's he true. doesn't pl- he doesn't play and defense is one of the harder positions to play in hockey to pick up and having a young kid out there just looking like he knows like he's been playing in the nhl for 10 years and he's seen like he's seen everything is just really impressive and he almost makes it look effortless as well i mean he knows what he's doing he you don't really see him out of position he knows when to pinch he gets back well he seems to cover his defensive responsibilities well so that's not something that i'm used to seeing out of any sabers defenseman and it's something that you'd probably be hard pressed to see out of most young defensemen but He's been demonstrating he's got a good knowledge for the game. Yeah, it's something we've seen with a lot of the recent young defensemen who have come in, guys like Aaron Eckblad and top defensive draft picks sometimes have take a couple of years to really adjust to the speed and physicality of the, the NHL game, especially when they come right out of juniors or out of Europe, where a guy like Darlene is. Justin, I know you're troubleshooting over there, but did you have someone you wanted to, to jump in and mention? I was going to say Darlene, actually, for, for all the reasons Mike stated. Just super uh, calm. When he's under pressure, he doesn't make mistakes. He makes the right play. Very calm, composed. Um, he's such a good skater. And he always makes the right play with the puck. But like, he must be a tank. Because when he pinches and he makes hits on guys, he hits them oh. hard. Oh, they were For saying... an 18-year-old kid, he, he made a pinch in the middle of the game yesterday. Pinched in and hit a forward and a half wall. Didn't knock him down, but it was a stiff... It looked like it hurt. Yeah, but, um, yeah, I remember the hit you were talking about. I was just about to say that, that he was, um, who I forget who it was he hit, but the for, they were saying the forward was bigger than he was, and he just stood him right up. I was nervous when Hutton got lit up a little bit against Colorado and um, against San Jose, and I was talking either in the Slack chat or to Justin and said I was nervous that Hutton was going to be the the next victim of fans thinking that we need a better goaltender because I was never mad at Robin Leonard looking at what was in front of him. Right. And he's actually had a nice start in, in on the island, but I was never angry with goaltending because it didn't matter who it was with that team in front of them. And there's been a couple of games where Hutton's been hung out to dry and he's given up four or five goals, and I'm nervous people are going to say they need a better goalie. 
I'm glad I haven't seen it yet because in the games that they've won, like yesterday, you mentioned that save with 40 seconds. Mm-hmm. Those bananas. The dude is – Hutton has made two to three 10 bell saves every game. Allmark's been good when he's called on. Uh, the L.A. game, he really wasn't tested at all. Um, but the goaltenders have been a really nice surprise, and Hutton has been – fantastic it was interesting to me the vitriol that Hutton faced after the Vegas game because of what Allmark did in the Arizona game right I mean that's fairly middling competition that you're getting in the Arizona. yes he got a shutout but all shutouts are not created equal mm-hmm. and I think yes it was a bit of a struggle there when you're facing the to me, the two best teams on the road trip at this point in, in what we've seen Vegas come back from a little bit. And Vegas had a rough start to the season, but I think they're going to be okay. San Jose was clearly the best team in possibly in that division. I think Possibly would, in the I, league. I think even though they had a slow start, I think it's reasonable to think that that team's going to win the Pacific. Um, so, yeah, Hutton faced a couple of good teams, but he's come up big when necessary and we, you mentioned we, we the Vegas said, game all Mark's going to play two of these five games all Mark played two of those five games he Look great. went two and oh did well to his credit he drew probably the two weakest teams which is good so, that you have a backup goal so that you can win those games you, you mentioned the Vegas game and I know I was was complaining in the slack chat Vegas was 0 for 16 on their power play. They scored, what, three power play goals. They had not scored more than two goals all year. They scored four. They had not entered the third period with a lead. They were in the lead 2 nothing going into the third. And I kept saying the Sabres are reverse kryptonite. And that feels like Buffalo sports in a nutshell. How many times have the Bills played a team that hasn't had a 100-yard rusher in four years? And they have two guys run for 100 yards. The Sabres have... Yeah, and the Sabres have, um, you know, play a team that is just absolutely snake bitten. You know, the the Ducks haven't had a right handed defenseman score a goal in eighty six games, and then the first shot by a right handed defenseman goes in. Like, so I was really frustrated against. You know, I'm listening to these stats, like these stats that are so pure cured that no one even cares about them. But I was mad. I'm like, why are they? You know, every stat that says Vegas has not been a good team is getting blown out of the water tonight as they absolutely open up a can on Buffalo. And it wasn't even the vitriol, going back to your point, Bill, about uh, Hutton after the, the 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 Vegas game. It was in the middle of the game yesterday. That second goal, admittedly not his brightest shining yeah. moment. But, man, I opened up my Twitter after that second goal because I had just gotten home. And people were just like, why in the hell is Allmark not in? Who is this? He's regressing back to the mean. And, boy, I'll tell you, all those people got real quiet when Hutton went and shut down Anaheim the rest of the way and wrote out that victory. I feel like we're almost a self-fulfilling prophecy sometimes as Buffalo sports fans, and we have reasons to be. But as the second we see something going bad, we assume it's going to go all the mm-hmm. way bad. Yeah, but we see Jack history. have a bad defensive game. We assume that Jack doesn't care about defense. We see Hutton let in a weak goal. We assume he's going to be Robin Leonard in a shootout. We just got to realize that this is a team that is growing. A lot of these guys are still learning to play together. Mm-hmm. And I think we're just starting to see some of the flashes of familiarity with these guys. A goaltender getting used to his defensemen. Sanders getting used to their for- their forward pairings. We just got to ride it out. And I think you mentioned that stretch that they're going on here. These next seven games, it feels like a very winnable stretch where you could come out with a 5-2 and two record maybe. And then you're looking real good here mm-hmm. as you approach the quarter mark of the season. The Sabres haven't been good to start a season in, in Eon. Since the year that they started like 18-0 and 0 or whatever, they have not been good. Even when they were a good team, they would not be... Takes them a little while. Yeah, and it's interesting because when you look at a lot of teams that make the playoffs, they have bad like marches and Aprils because they're kind of banged up. But they're they're already in good shape that they could win. 30% of their last 10 games, three, uh, let me rephrase it. They can win three of their last 10 games and still get in. Math checks out. Um, yeah, because they have have slotted themselves in a position that they are comfortable. And it would be nice to go into Christmas <laughs> in a playoff spot I or mean, to be going down the stretch with a cushion to say that they're not in the battle for the glorious battle for a wild card, <laughs> that they are maybe. Well, they can't take away the points that you've already got. Correct. So True. Versus it being the uphill battle, you're in a good spot that you're already on top of the hill. I right. mean, there's not very many teams that do win that uphill battle, start bad, and um, make the playoffs. I mean, the only one that I can really think of that it's kind of their M.O. is Anaheim usually. But other than that, it's not too often where you start poorly and then go on and win your division. I mean, how long has it been since a game in January really felt like it meant something to the fan base? Like my November. Mom, yeah. <laughs> so my, my mom was born in January, and every year for her birthday, I take her to a Sabres game, and every year I go on StubHub, and I'm amazed by the quality of tickets I am able to buy for the low amount of money Correct. that I'm able to spend on them comparably because people are checked out by Christmas. And I think people would just be excited, even if this season turns out to be 
not what we're hoping it's going to be. Even if the season turns out to be where we're still five to ten points out of a wild card. I think just having progress. something to play at this point, having a team to watch and be invested in 75% plus of a hockey season feels like a victory. And here, nine out of 82 games in, it's early to say, and a lot of things can change. But I feel like this, I, I was entertained. I enjoyed watching the game yesterday. I enjoyed watching the game Saturday. Even in losses, at least for a couple of periods, I'm generally enjoying watching the team do something. Do you guys remember the Sabres schedule last year that they played Toronto six times in like the last six weeks of the season? Mm -hmm. And I remember like those games are going to mean something. You're going to have Jack versus Austin and it's going to be for a playoff spot and it's going to be competitive. Yeah, those games did not mean squat pretty much to either team. Toronto was already comfortably in the playoff spot and Buffalo was... And you play, yeah. I would just love to see a Sabres home game against Toronto that isn't 90% Leafs fans yeah. because it's already going to be a decent amount of traveling fans. But the last few years, it's just been all Sabres fans selling their tickets mm -hmm. to the, the they guys coming out from Ontario. triple their money. And, yeah. I just want to see a Sabres game where it's as loud when we score as it is when Toronto mm -hmm. scores. And again, though, I hate that we're, we don't play them till November again this year. It's really? another backloaded schedule against Toronto. Last year, they never played Toronto until March. Which is bizarre. And then it was like six games in just March and April. I would love one of those opening games. We always get against the division team. I would love an opener against Toronto. Try to catch them while they're mm -hmm. still. This year probably games. would have been a buzzsaw because well, they. Yeah. <laughs> they're pretty good right now. You know, the Sabres are only two points behind the same number of games with Toronto. Toronto's got 12 points in nine games. Sabres have 10. Now They've that, cooled off a little bit. That tends to be on the higher end. And as we look at the divisions and the standings right now, and I do think this is kind of important to just kind of get a, a rough gauge of where the Sabres are. They have. They lead the league in games played. Um, only Toronto and themselves have played nine in the East. Uh, as we record tonight, it does look like um, Carolina up 2 nothing on Detroit. The Avalanche have already defeated the Flyers, and the Capitals play later tonight at Vancouver. So uh, a few more uh, Eastern Conference teams have some competition. But right now, the Metropolitan, not not very good. Um, let's be honest right now. Carolina leads it with nine, and then there's eight, uh, five teams with eight points each. Yeah, uh, I, I think... Varying levels of, of games played there between Jersey, Pittsburgh, uh, the Blue Jackets, Caps, and Flyers. I think Washington and, Colum and Columbus will end up taking two of those top three spots, and they're just getting caught up earlier in the season. But, I mean, yeah, the, the top of the Metropolitan Division, I don't think that Carolina can keep up the pace that they are right now. I could be wrong. New Jersey is very hit and miss, and you figure Pittsburgh's probably good for something, good for at least a wild card, but they they don't feel untouchable anymore. They no. feel like there's chinks in the armor. They're a beatable hockey team. Everything kind of went off the rails once once Washington beat them. It, the, the whole the idea of the gone. mystique, I think, is, is gone. Um, and, and we'll see, but there are some real garbage teams in the uh, in the Eastern Conference. And, you know, Detroit... They look pretty bad. The Rangers. Awful. They were 0 and 5 right before they won a game? Yeah, they won Saturday for the first time the, in overtime. Yeah. I, you know, Florida hasn't got, you know, gotten a little unlucky with the three overtime losses already, but they made. They're missing Luongo. Not They're missing they lost Luongo. to Detroit, so. They're missing Luongo. Right. Reimer was good last year as a backup. This year he's struggling. But I'm curious with Luongo. He's. Boy, when, that, when the goalie hits the cliff. And he's also Luongo's now seven he's foot two and three hundred pounds. He's he just, hurt I'm all just the time. So, yeah, can you get sixty games out of Luongo? I don't know. Mm. Probably not. Probably forty five to fifty at right. this point. With how so often you need he gets to have injured. Reimer do something, and if he's not going to do anything, then nope. that seems like it could be real tough. If you're leaking that extra goal every couple games, it's going to come back. To Especially with as many close games as they're playing right now. So it seems to re whereas Buffalo has been the complete opposite. I mean, they're They've, you know, the the scoring difference is only minus three, but it feels like it's just wild swings. I mean, we've seen them lose by four and five, and we've seen them win by three and four in lots of different cases this year so far. So we'll see. They've yet to play a one goal. Yeah, let's say they don't when, have a one 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 goal game, which is amazing through nine that, games. That seems almost impossible to say in when, today's NHL. When the season was starting, we said what teams are definitely better than Buffalo because we're trying to figure out if they can make the playoffs. So we have a very small sample size. Let's go through it again. What teams are better than Buffalo? I don't think Montreal is better than Buffalo, and they're no. ahead of them in the standings. Um, Tampa and New Toronto, Jersey probably. might be. Carolina is not. I don't know. what Carolina just must be have a horseshoe up their ass because I don't they, they play, they they play traded, in the weaker of the two divisions they so. traded Noah Hannafin and Jeff Skinner and they are in the top of their division I mean Dougie Hamilton is not exactly bottom sure. of the barrel 
Sure, but, but tra- I mean, yeah, trading Skinner for draft picks and relying on guys like Sebastian Aho and Andrei Vechnikov and guys like that who are young and I don't know, maybe they they, they could have be a wild Furlan card too. Team. Don't forget, and Furlan played top line minutes with Monahan and Goudreau all of last year. Did. So I mean, like maybe, maybe that's a team that can make the playoffs here this year. But I, are they better on paper than Buffalo right now? Not really to me. No. Toronto and Tampa, I would say, are mm-hmm. New Jersey maybe. They 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 have some top level talent and guys like Taylor Hall, but I mean, are they a deeper team than Buffalo if all those guys in Buffalo show up? If, if you're a Posos and Reinhardt's of the world have great seasons, is New Jersey better than Buffalo? I don't know. And how good is Keith Kincaid? Can he keep it up? Like in Pittsburgh, certainly has the the renowned top end talent, but they're not doing a ton so far this season. I mean, Boston beat Buffalo in one game, but they came off that game where they just got run out of the building by Washington, so they're all over the they place. They looked really good, though. <laughs> They've been that top line is. Well, the top line is yeah, but if crazy good. you if the the teams that make deep playoff runs are the teams that have two or three yeah. lines that can go in any situation. And I don't know that Boston has that. Yeah. Like obviously, Pasternak is out of this world with how he's playing right now, and his line mates are just contributing. But it, but I feel like it's almost just a byproduct of how good Pasternak is at this point. But then you look down, Ottawa's. I just Ottawa's one more Ottawa's situation Montreal. away from a train wreck. Yeah, Columbus is top two players are one one out of Columbus. Yeah, I want Columbus to tank so that Artemi Panarin comes to Buffalo. Philly's struggling. The Islanders are missing their best player and haven't recovered from that yet. Washington is probably good, but they're struggling out of the gate. I mean, who else is down there? Detroit, Detroit's Florida, down there. Florida's down there. Can you scroll down the for Rangers us, Justin, are down so we there. can see who else is down there? Even in the West, who who's good in the yeah, NHL? Exactly. Is it? San I mean, Jose, San Jose, who so started Tampa slowly. Bay. Is it? It kind of Edmonton is not do good. Feel like Edmonton's the two not teams, good at all. Right? Calgary's okay, right? They've won Calgary's a couple okay. Games. Calgary's going to be top four in that conference for lack of competition. Mm-hmm. I just, I don't. Every Anaheim one, might be okay. Colorado's good. Back. Colorado, Colorado's is good. really good actually. I, every one of these teams have just, they, they all, every one of them seems to have the flaw. I would agree that San Jose and Tampa Bay feel like maybe the the two best teams and then Colorado if they can actually keep it together for once in the playoffs cuz it's been it's been a while decade plus um, imagine being Matt Duchesne yeah. just imagine that for a second I want out of this shitty place it leaves and they immediately become Go, goes to Ottawa where they immediately trade their captain and a and bunch of other top Hoffman players is, well, not, immediate, not immediately not immediately his wife is cyberbullying yeah good it's such good a times bizarre. I mean, Colorado. I think Colorado and Washington are still the two best teams in the NHL as it stands right now. The Jets are pretty good too. Winnipeg is they're very losing good. right and now. And Nashville is Nashville's always Nashville. Mm-hmm. You can, they can just put up six goals. It feels like it will. But sometimes. they're without Pekarene long term. Be interesting to see how UC Saros can mm-hmm. do and that backup goaltender role. But I mean, we just lay it out here. Are, are there that many teams on paper that are demonstrably better than the Buffalo Sabres are? It just feels like in hockey, especially that. You know, with half the teams making the playoffs, more than half the team, eight out of 31 now, like the law 16. of averages said you should be good enough. I'm sorry. Yes. 16 <laughs> out of 31. But you like the law of averages says you should be able to get in there once in a while, you know, and the Sabres once have every a few years. Have, yeah. yeah. The Sabres haven't been able to even figure that out, you know, and it's not for victimhood of being in a strong division like the Bills with the Patriots. Like, it's just they haven't been able they haven't been able to get out of their own they, way. They but, haven't been good. Right. Exactly. I mean, you don't need move, to be great, just good. I mean, and they any, and almost any move for the last how many years was it? Seven years has just doesn't seem to have gone the way people, the front office has expected yeah. it to go. Yeah, that O'Reilly trade may be the biggest example. You trade away a, a bunch of young prospects and you bring in a guy that you want to be the centerpiece, a cornerstone going forward, and that didn't work out. So, yeah. So trade. they have a couple more games coming up here this week. They do have a couple days off following that packed start in the five-game road trip. They are home here on this upcoming Thursday against Les Habitants, the Canadians of Montreal. That feels like a Montreal team that they've been, I don't want to say overperforming, but they seem to be performing better than their talent level would feel. I would agree. I mean, that's a very winnable game. First time on home ice in two weeks. Hope to see a hungry Sabres team well-rested on top of that. Yeah, they flew home last night. Yeah. So they have a couple days now to recover and Get back on the fresh ice here after playing four games in five days. Chance to recover and get ready for Montreal. That's it's it's weird almost not seeing Montreal until this point. I feel like every season we see Montreal right out the gate. We have a disappointing game against them. We feel we should win, so maybe this will be the year we finally get that October win against the Canadians. And then quickly turn around on Saturday and travel to Columbus. 
uh, for a game against the Blue Jackets, and that's a tough matchup. Columbus certainly has the talent, and yeah, I mean that goal by Anthony Duclair the other day was absolutely mm-hmm. just filthy, disgusting. Someone's a real jerk and made sure a Flyers fan <laughs> saw that in our group chat. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> you weren't the first person to send it. <laughs> um, but I mean, Columbus again. None of these teams are, t- are untouchable. No. Um, and then they come back home, and their next home game will be next Tuesday. For those of you nursing your your Monday Night Football hangovers, you can go watch the uh, the Sabres host the Calgary Flames. Because what are the Eastern Conference teams anyway? Let's play only Western Conference teams here for the entire month of October. But I'm good with that because that, that means that th- later games are going to be more meaningful. Yeah, that also might be a better uh, gauge to where this team is and where it needs to improve going through playing those important conference games. Yeah, I think Columbus and Calgary are going to be challenges for this team and just so you know you catch the flames on the second game of a back-to-back they play in toronto monday at seven and play in buffalo tuesday at seven very so far away the metropolis to the north toronto you, but you catch the flames playing back-to-back while you're sitting on two days rest so in theory beat you, the flames assuming that we'll see linus Olmark at some point during this uh these next three games probably saturday yeah give him columbus so three games left to try to finish the month of October for a winning record and the first time in what's got to be years. Do you think that they can win two out of the next three games and keep that record above 500? I think win all three of those games pretty mm-hmm. easily. The Habs are overachieving right now. Columbus is still struggling. Calgary and back-to-back. They will struggle against Calgary, though. They always do. And Columbus Calgary's could play Friday night, too. They... And the only reason I'm wondering if Columbus plays Friday because you might not play Bob then. You might get... Corpusala. Corpusala. Whenever they play Calgary, it's like wrestling on ice. So they, they play physical hockey. And Sabres aren't good at that usually, but they got Boga back. How about Boga coming back in the lineup? He's brittle, but he's fought every game so far. <laughs> and he's a terrifying <laughs> Will fucking Will he human. still be healthy? Like, the, 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 the fight yesterday. And he he looked, took it easy on him, but he could have tuned him up. I would have wet myself. <laughs> he could have. He's an angry <laughs> man, man. Columbus does not play Friday. They play I mean, Thursday. He was, he, he was posting those videos and working out. And like whenever they, that one dude called him out about going to the gym, <laughs> he's like, that. "Come work out, and be try not to puke or something." <laughs> you can you can see how how overpowering he is in some of these games. He's a pretty strong dude. Maybe he works out too hard. Is why he's always hurt all the time. I mean, he just keeps falling through doors wherever he goes. I love that back to back against Ottawa to open yeah. up November. By the way, that feels like it could be a huge confidence boosting four points for this team. And of course, you don't want to look past an Ottawa team. But I feel like this the wheels are going to fall off that team at some point sooner than later. Then the and Rangers I hope it's right at the end of that, too. Three and four. It feels very winnable. That's a weird travel schedule. They have a really weird travel schedule coming up here the next week and a half. Look at how many games at are in the Ottawa, back part of that Thursday, month. Thursday, home to Ottawa on Saturday afternoon at the Rangers Saturday night. They play six and ten oh, to end the month. That's a ton. And they're, yeah, and then the 21st home to Philly, 23rd home to Montreal, 24th at Detroit, then home to San Jose, Two days later, they do the back-to-back in Florida at Tampa and at the that's Panthers. That's a lot of hockey. That's a lot of hockey, and that's coming off a of back-to-back. That's three back-to-backs in consecutive weeks. That's that's going to be a real test of this team's endurance. So win these seven games then or the next you know, six or the next seven. because yeah, the, uh, the honeymoon period for this team looks to end around the 13th when the Tampa Bay Lightning come to town. you got Tampa Bay, Winnipeg, Minnesota, Pittsburgh, four straight games. Those are all playoff contender teams. That will yeah. really show what this team is all about. <laughs> We got Rasmus Dahlin. I don't give a shit. What's going on in Ottawa right now, though? Overachieving pretty hard, huh? Ottawa and Montreal. They four and one. It's crazy. Sometimes things just bounce right for you for a couple games. So the test is going to be if they can keep it going. I don't see how they keep it going to this point. I mean, I think Buffalo has all the the tools to extend a winning season indefinitely moving forward. I don't see a couple. There's a couple teams in this division that included. I don't think they have anything down the road. It could be a month of good hockey. It could be a game here and there. I think they're bottom five in the conference easy. How much better do we feel about the Sabres after this West Coast road trip early on in the season? Pretty good. And minus the uh, panicking in the Vegas game. And we all kind of <laughs> I feel looked really right at me, good rightfully so. But I think we all good. kind of rolled off that San Jose game right away. It's kind of interesting to see how they're going to stack up. And they did play well for periods. They did. And just, I feel like San Jose. Capitalized. Well, that dumb, How many that dumbass this? penalty by Oposo thirty right seconds into the game. Oh God, that yeah. just absolutely. He, it's like he took a sledgehammer to his teammate's knees because, like, <laughs> yeah. And it's tough because I feel like Oposo's had a really good start to the season, but that's the, well. the most defining moment of him so far is that one. So it, hopefully he has a chance to recuperate. From he that. redeemed himself with a goal yesterday. That, that wasn't sense. a good game for him at all. 
But uh, he was, I was watching a lot of the game. He was trying to grind through it hard. He was working his ass off. He was down behind the net a lot. He was giving it everything. He knew he messed up, but he was trying to grind through it for his team. It was visible. It was pretty, pretty obvious to me. He took another penalty later on. I don't think San Jose scored on it, but he yeah. did take three pe- three penalties or th- you know six minutes in penalties for a scoring forward is a lot in the, a game. The difference in that game was just capitalizing on the chances. Yeah. As soon as they did, Sabres had enough chances to score, but they're just putting high and wide. And with the Connor Sheary had a good chance on breakaway, shot a wide. It happened often. They had game. the two posts yesterday, and I was getting nervous because <laughs> yeah. Skinner hit the post and then Eichel hit the post, and yep. I'm like, son of a bitch. That's, that's, that's always one that's of the things that happens saying, to like, these teams because those chances when they don't go in. It feels like we never get to make up those chances yeah. in games. You look at those Sabres losses the last couple of seasons, like, oh, well, there was this post and there was this missed chance, but they never got another chance to make up for it. But yesterday they did, and yesterday they just kept grinding. Is that kind of grinding mentality to it? Don't want to don't give that kind of lunch pail mentality necessary to the hockey team. It's a lot of skill, too. But mentally, they weren't defeatist about falling behind early to Anaheim. We talked about on the Slack chat that there was a stretch of time that at five on five, it looked like they were on a power play. Yeah. They really just they had the puck in the offensive zone for two shifts. They shift they they changed. They made a wholesale change throughout this entire shift and the puck never left the zone. And that's the vision with building your team around a guy like Rasmus Dahlin on the back end is guys who can keep that play alive at the blue line, facilitate. And we saw a little bit of that from the defensive core yesterday. That kind of one of the few flashes I feel like in the year that we've seen what Phil Housley wants to build the mm. defense to be. And I hope that we get to see more of that because if they can just keep teams pinned back like that, more often than not, you keep the other team in their end for two minutes, you tire out those legs, you're going to get a good scoring chance, a goal, or they're going to take a penalty. You drop penalty, yeah. Yeah, because there's, no there's no chance to change when you're pinned in your defensive zone. Right. Does this team have an identity yet? And what I mean by that is a play style is a, like, it doesn't always have to be good, but I feel like the Sabres haven't had a defining aspect of their game in a long time. It, it, you can go back 20 years and say, Hashik's going to make 40 saves, they're going to score two goals, and they're going to beat you two to one. Or um, the there was a stretch of time, even recently, like three years ago, if you took a penalty, the Sabres were going to score on you. Mm-hmm. Like even though they weren't a good team, their power play was like Lethal. number two in the league, and like they had that identity. There was the hardest working team in hockey in '99 that they just skated harder than you did. But there hasn't been a lot of, and I'm not saying you have to have one. You don't have to have one to be relevant or to be a good team. But what's this team's meal ticket? I, I, I'm not looking for a good or a bad answer, but do, through nine games, do we have an idea of what this team's MO is going to be? I think it's just speed at this point. Yeah, I think that's what they're trying refreshing. to be. It is refreshing. And it, I mean, there's a lot of players on this roster currently who maybe don't match up with that identity yet. I think it's an identity that's being built. I think they're aiming to build a quick puck-moving team. It starts with a great skating defenseman in Rasmus Stalin, a hard skating couple of forwards, guys like Reinhardt, Eichel, and Skinner, guys like Connor Sheary, Guys like Aposo, who maybe not, isn't the fastest guy, but he skates real hard and yeah, he'll mid, go after every puck. Middle stat, too. Middle stat. I think they're trying to build a, a team that is fast, and I think that's where the NHL is going. We've seen so many games here this season. How many? We've seen five goals, six goals, seven goals up on the board. Teams are moving to just trying to just get volume of pucks, just rush after rush after rush and open the game up. And I think that the Sabres are trying to get in on that trend of puck moving, quick, aggressive scoring hockey teams. I don't see it yet. Speed, maybe, but not really a well-rounded speed. Um, maybe young talent, skill. They got a lot of skill players, probably. I think it's, it's still working on that identity. I think part yeah. of it is good. Oh, goal- it's certainly a working. Part of it is going to be good goaltending because that, like, I know that sounds so stupid, but there's a lot of teams that the goalie doesn't have to be good. Be- like Colorado, Farlamov is not a world beater, but he doesn't have to be. He's got the second easiest job in sports with him being the Kansas City Chiefs punter. Sure. <laughs> Which is who? Is it Britton Colquitt? Britton Colquitt. Yeah. But, yeah, it's like he – Varlamov just needs to not shit all over himself and his team will score him four goals and he'll be just fine. <laughs> um, but the Sabres will need good goaltending. It's been evident that they will need good goaltending, you know, to win games. But that's okay. If you have a good goalie, that's okay. Right? Goaltending's – goaltending's, you know, 50% of the game unless you have a bad goalie. Then it's like 80% 100%. of the game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And then shootouts, it becomes the entire talking point for an entire Sabres season. Yes. <laughs> or two. Or two. Yeah. I'm going to go back a little bit and change my answer to the Sabres that's, that uh, impressed me the most so far. Yeah. I wonder what Casey Middlestat. Hmm. I mean, he really kind of came out during that West Coast trip. He put him up on a, second, on a better line with more skill. And you just see him playing his game more. He's one of the few guys shooting the puck when he has a chance. And he's got a good shot. And he's, he's showing it. They put him on the power play. And I love him up there much better than Kyle Laposo. Mm-hmm. He had one 
one poor play yesterday where he kind of had a quick backhand sauce over to Eichel across the ice. And he just didn't get enough air on it and got picked off and got dumped out of the zone. But he's got the vision and the hands. And uh, I just. I, you see the penalty he drew yesterday? Yeah. Took the puck to the right side on the right wing, behind the net, came back out between yep. the face off circles and. Trick out trip. Beautiful. Quick aside on that. I don't know who I don't remember who it was, but I love whoever went up to him right away after that penalty and just gave him immediate like that was, great, that was a great job on that Yeah, play. I think it was Scandella. Just, no, it was uh Reinhardt. Was just, it? Yeah. Just like they were chuckling. Just, just telling yeah. Lilik is like, there, that was such a great play. Yeah. And just like that's the kind of play you you don't you can't teach something no. like that. He's gotta know he's gotta be aware of the other guy, how to shield the puck away from him. That was a great play by Casey. And, and the defenseman is just the desperate. The defenseman just getting torched and just has a stick out there saying a prayer, and he chops him down. And the thing about Middlesat too is you got to remember, and I said in a local radio station, is that he, two years ago he's playing high school hockey. Yeah, think about that. Yep. Two years you're in the NHL now. Three years ago you're playing high school. Last year he was in the World Juniors. Correct. Yeah. Less than I, a year ago, I was at yeah. the game on you know de- December 28th. He was playing junior hockey. It's cliche, but you can see him visibly getting better every game. And best it's just, and best it's just, game by a Buffalo professional athlete at the round. And it's just confidence. <laughs> it's just confidence. And playing center, his, his only qualm playing center at this young of age um, is just learning how to play defensively. Brady yeah. Brady Kachuk might have been better than him that day. But, yeah. you know, I'm just <laughs> Point, nit, all, nitpicking. All notwithstanding. Nitpicking. Um, but, but, but who's healthy right now? Brady Kachuk isn't, so yeah. Sabres win again. But the future is bright, though. We, even, we talked about Rochester a little bit. Yeah. Olafson is down in Rochester. He's lighting it up. That, lighting, lighting it up. It up. <laughs> that goal and, he had the other day. This the release on that guy. Mm. Unbelievable, it's the release insane. that he has. I, uh, I, when I saw the uh, Sabres prospect tournament, I, tw- I tweeted he's got a second like release and a second like release, and like four people told me to calm down. But it's 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 real. He really he gets it off quick and with a ton of power. And he's another guy that's that was a victim of the roster. Like yeah. he, who you can't send Berglund or Sabotka down or Gergensen's or Larson or so it's a guy that's got a two way deal. Hope, who hasn't I, proven I, I hope anything they do yet. send Berglund or Sabotka down at some point just so we can get Olafson off to an incredible start. Nylander's off to a great start. Smith is off to a great start. And then the defense, you got Gooley and Pilot along with apparently Zach Redmond. Yeah, but Gooley and Pilot and the top six in points for that team is very impressive. Well, I mean, that's what you want a guy like Brendan Gooley to be able mm-hmm. to contribute to. I mean, we talk about you want your defense. Look, what was the biggest bugaboo about this team as they started sliding all the way down the cliff is that the defense could not clear their own zone, could not make a pass ahead to a forward, could not do anything to help their team get offense. And I think we have a couple of them up with the team right now and a couple coming up in the system, a couple of defensemen who are going to be able to both defend their own end pretty well, but also at least you know have their head around and but, play some offense right, and even help if, the team. Even if Gooley and Pilot were up here making mistakes, Bullio and, K- and Casey Nelson are making those mistakes. So give me a guy that's better at moving the puck up the ice. Like, Nelson has improved a lot recently. He he, I, a I, lot. I really like liked Nelson. Nelson last year a lot. And when he re-signed for Peanuts, I was stoked. We were in the Slack chat really excited. Yeah. He started out this year kind of looking pretty shitty, and he has gotten better. But if if you're going to have you know guys that are making mistakes anyway or not, like give me Olafson and Nylander over Sabotka and Berglund. Like, they're just it's a higher ceiling, I guess. But I'm not mad at Sabotka and Berglund. Yesterday, as the game was winding down, Berglund had the puck on his stick at the what would be the right wing faceoff dot for Anaheim, and instead of using the glass to chip it out, he tried to pass and it got picked off. And I was like, son of a bitch! I was so mad because there's 30 seconds left. Use the glass, get it out, even if it's an icing, bleed the clock, right? Yeah, well, absolutely. He did not give up on that play because doesn't he go to the other side of the ice, win a battle along the boards, and get the empty netter? And I was almost like, that's a veteran play. Like, he made a mistake. He Maybe he didn't feel like it was a mistake because, you know, but I'm watching it, like, just get the puck out. He ends up going, blocking the shot, winning a battle, and taking it off the center ice and, and potting it from the in the empty net. And I was like, you know what? Nice play, Berglund. Like, you made me upset, but you made up for it. Who was the first winger that you guys would like to see called up? There's a few really good ones to stand out. Would you like to see Olafson first with how hot he's playing? Do you want to see Nylander first? Is C.J. Smith the guy? Who do you guys envision as being the first forward maybe called up for the Sabres? I mean, someone's going to get hurt at some point. Someone's going to get called up at some point. Who is your choice for who you would like to see get their first run with the big club here this year? I mean, points, I, I see that. I'd like to see Nylander for first. I think he's one that's I like it. I agree. more pro-ready. I guess. I mean, he was he was really theoretically good. very close to making the team out yeah. of camp with how he played. But let's say, God forbid, Sherry comes goes down and they bring Nylander up and put him on the fourth line with Gergensen's. Well, and... that, that's I think that's what Jason Botterill has done a good job of so far, and he proved it in Pittsburgh when he was developing guys like Sherry, 
Kunakel, Rust. Gensel and Rust, yeah. Gensel. He's not just going to call some guy up and stick him and do what they did with Bailey and Baptiste for five years, which is just, all right, we're going to bring you up for Kale a game, O'Reilly. send you down, and bring you up and send you down, and bring you up and send you down on the fourth line. I think if a guy like that gets called up, he's going to at least get a chance to play some second or third line minutes. What do we do with Tage Thompson? He's fine. He's, he's been he's, a healthy scratch the last two games. So. He's fine. I don't know. You guys he's got a same amount of skill, great shot. And he just give him. He's twenty. But do you send him down and let him play? No. No, you want him back playing in, in the big club. Yeah. I think he goes down at some point if he keeps playing to this level. I don't I care mean, either way. I'm not. I'm not rooting for him though. to get sent no, down. He hasn't. But he's been a healthy scratch, and they've won two games yeah, without but, him. But it, what is he learning from the press box at Correct. this point? That's if, my if he's going to continue to be healthy scratch, and who knows if he will be, or if Bergman will be scratched, or who will be scratched? Thompson doesn't develop above the ice, and he's, he's a two on a two way contract. Send him down. Ice. And if we're not going to use him, I would just as rather let a guy like O'Regan get a couple of games in at center or Chris Golo or any of the guys we just talked about. Like someone who's going to get a chance to play. If it's a guy on a two way deal, I don't see the harm in letting someone get a run who's had a good start in Rochester if they don't have any intention in playing Tate Thompson 80% of the time. I just prefer him in a lineup over Sabaka or Berg with me. I do my too. Thing. I 100% agree with you. But, the they're, agree. but those guys can't go down without losing them, and I don't think they're willing to make that move at we'll this point. And they haven't made a mistake big enough. They haven't played poorly enough to be scratched, in my opinion. They haven't played great, but they haven't, you know, Sabaka and Berglund, I don't I don't hate them out there. They're not. They're a different play style. There's times not. where Berglund looks lost on defense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot, of, a lot of what was coming over. So with, does Tage Thompson, with, though. With like the, the trade, field. I mean, we acquired three guys who aren't really known for defense for one of the best two-way players in the NHL and Ryan O'Reilly. Yeah. I mean, that's a a loss on that end of the ice, but you hope that they make up for it at least a little bit with their neutral zone play, with occasional defense play, well, with yeah. some offensive play. And you can't forget in St. Louis, that was the second line. I mean, you had Schwartz, yeah. Shen, and Tarasenko, and your second line was Sabatka, Berglund, and whomever. Whoever. And they were good. Like, they, the Blues almost made the playoffs. They were, they ended up in the last game of the year, they didn't make the playoffs. They made a run after they traded, um, who they, who they give up? What, what is, he went to, is Stastny. They give up Stastny and still made a playoff run. And, you know, Sabaka and, and Berglund were a part of that. So they were top six forwards in a competitive division, you know, that contributed. It's not like they're, I don't know, they're not terrible, but. Not by any means. It should be fun to see the same result when they plug in players like Gooley and Pilot along with see, Dali. That's, can you imagine this team in three years? That's the best feeling about this team mm. is it's fun to watch now and it's entertaining now. But I don't think that this is by any means the ceiling for what this team can be. And it's what was talked about with Botterill coming in is that he wants to he wants to develop these guys. He wants all these guys in Rochester to play together, learn together, develop, and then they're going to come up here. And I feel like we're starting to get to the next phase of the Botterill plan, which is, all right, here's Nylander, here's Smith, here's Gooley, here's Pilot. And those guys start to get fit into this team, I think, in a couple of years. It's going to be a vastly different hockey team than it was at the tail end of the drought, and I am very excited to watch it. Well, this is a Palmer. This is Palmer's last year, right? Yes, I think, think so. it's also Correct. Bogosian. Sabaka's last year. No, it's Bogos. Bogos. Bogos is around for that too. He's got one or more year. Two or three. That's, he got one more year. Well, this year Molson comes year. off the payroll after this season. Oh, Matt, Matt Molson, Molson about, does in fact exist. Yeah. I'm not paying. Chilling out there in Ontario, California. Like the only reason Nylander's not here right now is he didn't make a top six role. Yeah. And Pommelville's gone next year. Maybe there's some room for him. Um, this is not next year. That's not what you're looking for. It is not. Is there a, a drop down there in that window where it says 1819? Maybe. Yep. I think Cap Friendly might have it for you, too, if you wanted to go that route. Damn it. Just keep talking. Okay. <laughs> So, anyone read any uh, good books lately? I got a pedicure today. It's exciting. Felt good. My feet still feel great. Not gonna lie. Did you like the service? Yeah. No you should, you should plug uh, whoever did give you your pedicure. Was I don't there? remember where we went, but my wife was just <laughs> like Rachel's Mediterranean. That's right. Delicious. And my wife. Wa- okay. You look great, by the way. Thank you. So that's why you're not wearing socks. I just hope I to hate God socks. they besides Skinner, by the way. We gotta keep that guy. I really hope they do. Do you want? Do you want like the eight-year deal? Do you want to lock him up? Well, it, it can only be a six-year deal right now. They can sign him to a seven-year deal post-trade deadline. Is the official wording of okay. whatever? So deal it's not we can eight get. because he wasn't here at the beginning. Exactly, and and they can acquire, they can accrue like half a season, which will make him eligible to sign for a seventh year. 
but not to later in the season. So I'm curious if that's their play to hold out for that. But so Pominville's gone. Gergensen's or here significantly cheaper. Yeah, I don't. I have a hard time believing he's going to be going to. If you have that many wingers waiting in the wings, sure. if you will, wingers I don't think you're going to keep a 36 year old forward if you with what you've got in Rochester. Yeah, and again, Gergensen's and Larson are RFA. Do you even tender Gergensen's? I was going to bring that up. You get you tender tender either of those guys. Yeah, either of them. They'll, they'll, tend, they'll, they'll, they'll tender. They'll one probably tender Larson and leave another. And Erod is an RFA. You tender him. Mm-hmm. You tender Remy Ely, depending on what you see from him this season, maybe. No, no, no. He's, got, he's got a full season here. They'll have better. I have no, they'll op- have better, I have no opinion of what he can be. They'll just have better options, I think. He's 23. Him. I mean, it's possible if you get him on a cheap deal. I mean, he's only making yeah, seven, I just think they have better options. k Yeah. I mean. Who's defensively coming off to? Scroll down for us. I think a super underrated play this year so far is Evan Rodriguez. Oh, he's been he's so good. He's so yeah. good this year. So, Boyo's an RFA. He's gone. Oh, what a RFA. shame. Tennyson's, Tennyson's going to be a UFA. off the books. That's tough. You hate to see it. He's got some blackmail somewhere. Right. He's going to be resigned. Remember when we <laughs> talked about how Tennyson literally could be the seventh defenseman in Rochester? There's six guys in Rochester that probably should play before him. I believe it. you got another year of Matt Hunwick, though, so we're not out of this deep, dark nightmare yet. God bless you. And uh, Linus Olmark is... Hunwick, Hunwick could just get uh, really. <laughs> Hunwick could just get Joffrey Lupul though and never come back from IR, right? Didn't that happen to Lupul in Toronto? Is that who it was? Yeah, Joffrey, good old Joffrey Lupul. Isn't that what happened to him? He like well, went on IR, but he wasn't hurt, but the yeah. team kept him there because my, my they, favorite hockey urban legend is that Joffrey Lupul was supposedly having sex with uh, Dean Fano's wife. Huh, yeah, and that's why he got released. This mm-hmm. could be trouble. This goalie situation could be trouble for the Sabers here. They'll Counter, well, Counter, well, Hunt, well, I mean, he, will he want to go somewhere for a starting opportunity? Which he might, he might be the starter here by the end of the season if he keeps playing well. I mean, Hutton's mm-hmm. playing equally as well, though. And Hutton's out here for two more seasons. Yeah. He's not going to want to wait another two well, more seasons. Well, and you got to remember, Hutton came here for less money because he wanted to start. Yes. He took $1.25 million less a year. That's a cheap yeah. contract. He got offered four a year to be a backup and if, turned if it they down. Could, they could convince Almark to resign as a 1A, 1B kind of situation, or even as a backup. They can get, to get two... Very good goalies at a very cheap price. And that can absolutely work if you look at teams going back to the cup years with Detroit. They had Chris Osgood and Mike Vernon that both played. They mm-hmm. had, You have situations where you can have a 1A and 1B, and it Fleur, can work. Flurry and Murray. Correct. It can work. It's not like it's – as long as neither guy is too egotistical or too much get out of my crease, it really can work. It can be – especially when 2.75 is not expensive for a goaltender. Oh, no. And if you re-sign oh, no. Linus, it's, it could be for a million I a mean, year. Linus isn't going to make – if he makes more than a million, it won't be much more than a Correct. million. And then you're paying two goaltenders for about what a lot of teams for are paying. Less. They're a number one guy. Lot, yeah. I think Brian, Brian Elliott's making more than the Sabres goaltending combination mm-hmm. right now. God help us all. Yep. So, I mean, like, but outside of those guys, like, there's not a lot coming off the books for the Sabres, but it, I think Pominville is. Matt Molson comes off the books. Did we mention that? <laughs> Matt Molson, uh, Sabres legend. Um can go and sign a vet men deal with Toronto and go play with Tavares again and put up 40 goals. Probably. And then be very outspoken against the Sabres. He's super outspoken about how Buffalo mismanaged him by shoving him to California, which is getting paid $3 million a year to play hockey in California sounds like some sort of paradise. Uh, but I'm sure it's just terrible. Terrible for him. I Ontario think. is not a bad area. Couldn't Cal- tell you a thing about I've it. Never been to I, Ontario, I, used to live near, I used to live near that area, okay. so... Couldn't tell you where it is on a map other than Northern California. Southern. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> it's about 50, 60, 50 shot. <laughs> and you blew it. About 60 miles it. or so east of L.A. Um, is Just we, a straight shot down the 10 freeway and you're in L.A. Do we have anything else you guys want to talk about hockey wise before we go to the um, the healthy scratch? Or do we want to talk bills for 30 seconds before we give up? We're getting a phone call right now. Actually, oh, Excellent. Hello. I'm oh, sorry, we're having some technical difficulties here. Hello. Classic. Get one guy for one week and immediately falls off the wagon. Yeah. Hello. 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 Hello? Who is this? Hello. Hello. This is uh, Sage Thompson. How are you doing? <laughs> this wow. is the, the Healthy Scratch interview brought to you by the Healthy Scratch at Harbor Center. Uh, Tage, thanks for taking some time out of eating what I assume to be a cheesesteak to join us. Um, now, before we get into too much about your currencies, and you spent the last part of your career in uh, in St. Louis, uh, just how good 
are the blues and the blues music culture in the city of St. Louis? Hello? <laughs> <laughs> Paige Thompson. Who am I talking to? Uh, you're on with the 716 Sports Podcast, Paige. Okay. Do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I'm Steve. Well, you clearly no, asked one. No, it's fine. Um, out of the cities that you've played hockey in so far, being just Buffalo and St. Louis, uh, which city is better and why is it Buffalo? Kalamazoo, Michigan. Next question. If you could have dinner with any person, living or dead, who would it be? Somebody dead. <laughs> Next question. Tage, you sound a little salty for being scratched these last two games. What do you think that the teams won these two games without you in the lineup? Let me tell you something about Tage Thompson. <laughs> Tage Thompson doesn't take shit laying down. Okay? I'm going to personally kneecap Evan Rodriguez. <laughs> or, um, <clears throat> uh, it would be a shame if Evan Rodriguez tears his ACL in practice tomorrow, wouldn't it? Huh? That'd be a real bummer, wouldn't it? That'd be a real shame, Evan uh, Rodriguez. Tate. That motherfucker. He is so fast. I just want to fucking kill him. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. <clears throat> Next question. Is this residual anger from growing up with a name like Tage your whole life? How do you spell your name, motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> wow, he did his research, Justin. He's got you there. You want to know how I got the name Tage? Yeah. Just be... 10? <laughs> you want to know? Let's hear it. You know what my mom wanted to name me? Cage? Anderson. Hmm. You know what my dad wanted to name me? Javier. And that's why I'm named Cage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the natural melding of Javier Anderson Thompson. Tage, I want to see if we can talk to talk to you about some, some good times uh, spent on the sheet of ice. And it looks like if I go back to the time uh, that you played for the USPHL. And uh, this was 2013-14. I'm sorry if you didn't need to be reminded of that, but it appeared you played for the PAL Islanders, and in just 16 games played, you managed to, not to notch 31 points. Tell me about that season, um, that 2013-2014 campaign playing U18 hockey. Uh, great memory, Steve. Thanks for asking. You know, <laughs> how'd you, how'd you know my name? Whoa, how'd you know my name? We're all just named Steve, Steve. Okay, gotcha. Next question. <laughs> Now, so, Tage, before we let you go, we're going to see you back in the lineup here in the next couple of games, we're sure. What can we look forward to when Tage Thompson returns to the ice? Pain. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Tage Thompson, Sabres forward, all-around good guy and jovial being here with us on the Healthy Scratch interview brought to you by the Healthy Scratch at Harbor Center. Your new weekly saber segment. I want to thank the team and their public relations department for allowing us the great and distinct pleasure of interviewing Tage Thompson. Guys, I do want to fuck you all. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys want to uh, give any last parting shots to the uh, to the Buffalo Bills before we just give up hope for another week? Oh. Yay, another step closer to a number one draft pick. Can you believe this team has to play the fucking Patriots next week? What did everyone think was going to happen this past week right. when they started a 35 year quarterback who hasn't started a game in two years? And what did everyone expect? Can we can we I maybe mean, say that Josh Allen's the best quarterback on this roster? What does hurt? Right? Are we learning? Uh, are we learning through this that on okay. a very bad team, okay. Josh Allen is the best quarterback well, I mean, they he have? Probably is. But yeah. So I was at Tops on Sunday about. An hour before kickoff, I was picking up a few things, and I was listening to some people talking, because they're talking very loudly, and they're bitching about Peterman, they're bitching about Anderson, they're bitching about Allen, they're just bitching about everything, and it's like, did you guys not pay attention to the fact that the team barely made the playoffs last year on a last second touchdown, or last minute touchdown pass? By another team. By another team, that they had to get help to get in the playoffs, and the team, the offensive line regressed. You're 
but your most experienced quarterback had how many games played coming into this season? This really was not a team that was in a position to be any freaking good, yeah. and everybody's complaining about how bad they are. Just realize that there's a lot of work that has to be done, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Take the season for what it is and realize a few things, like they're going to get some salary cap space. There's going to be another draft. They can try to work, try to draw free agents in, lure them with money, or the promise of the fact that the defense is actually a pretty legit unit right now. Um, okay, yesterday excluded, but for the most part of the season, the defense has been a pretty legit unit. You've got to look at the long-term picture and stop looking at this season as if it was going to turn into something good because it was set up to be absolute shit. I mean, this time I was, I, before you guys got here, I started to ask Bill, like, do, do, does this stick to the Bills' first actual rebuild in the past 19 years? Can you sell it as that? I mean, I think last year was supposed to be start of a rebuild. I think process was a pretty word for suffering, like Darcy Regeer used, mm-hmm. but they accidentally made the playoffs. Well, but they also <laughs> traded for Calvin <laughs> Benjamin in week eight, which was yes. they realized, hey, we might be better than we thought we were, and let's see if we can ride this out. Yeah. Because they don't trade for Benjamin if they, you know, why why would you trade for any players? You would be looking for assets if it was a rebuild. So I think they stumbled into last year. Yeah, I that, mean, last year was a complete fluke like yeah, the well, team they was away expect- their entire their entire team yeah well the team should, and the team was supposed to only win like six games based off of performance and they overachieved in turnover margin which was a huge thing that's difficult to predict year over year even week over week so that was a, that was a big factor of it well, they run an they finally they basically got lucky they got paid back for all the years that they got unlucky and missed the playoffs in one year and then it was uh you know, there were multiple moves made to accelerate things. And the problem has been that you've left, you have a good half of a football team, and then you have left a complete barren wasteland on one side, which. And who's to say when you build the offense, what? the defense doesn't regress, no, wait, right? Wait, like, wait, that's wait. the struggle. Yeah. No, there's a, also a, almost a barren wasteland on special teams, too. Let's not forget about the fact that other than Bahorquas and uh, Hauschka, that. Special teams has been utter shit this year, too. Yeah, well, in the coverages, I mean, that's more scheme than anything. I'm willing to accept the fact that turnover on, you know, players, and I think they were expecting a little bit something more from, like, Ray Ray McLeod or whatever, and he's being left home on McLeod's trips McLeod's in the press so. box. Foster's on the streets. He didn't even bring him on a trip. He must have gotten in trouble. He, he did something bad. He said or did something. Yeah, it's McDermott said it was a football, a football move. Football <laughs> move. By football move, he called me a bitch. It was, record, it was reported as a non-football related issue. Yeah. And then McDermott says that they, it was a football. Yeah, <laughs> Every, everything in the world of football is somehow a football related issue. Let's talk about Sean McDermott real quick. How can you take anything he says at face value at this point? The guy's Can't. a walking book of cliches. I mean, I, like, and he's every coach's interview distilled into one man yeah, clap. But it's just he keeps spouting off these cliches. He keeps talking about viewing the tape. He is trying to remain even keeled, and I understand this, but he has completely lost sight of what the fan base is thinking right now to the point where that's because half the fan base doesn't know shit. I, I mean, seriously, have never There's disagreed so many, with that point, Mike. So many people, like I said about the expectations of the season, half the fan base doesn't know what's going on. They are having a historically bad offense. There's no reason to expect that after last season, they should have a historically bad offense considering that they have at least one probable potential hall of fame player on it. They have one probable Hall of Fame player on it. Gotcha. Two, re- two, receiver, oh, two receivers <laughs> that are underperforming. I can't even think of if they even have anybody that you can consider a legitimate third receiver. Okay, so um, why is this a good thing and why should people not be mad about that? Because people need to understand that that was what you were going to get this season. This was the rebuild I was signed on for last year, so the right. fact that it's one year later, I'm not upset. So you drafted and, the all-time leading receiver in NCAA history by receptions, and this is what you're getting out of him? Sure. So my only contention against that point would be, so now we're starting the rebuild here this year. You started with the quarterback that you want. They traded up in the draft and gave up assets for a guy who is a project, who they immediately then put into the starting lineup, so that he doesn't get to develop. 
and put him in a position where he's playing with a lack of talent that you would argue, and I think you could argue, that they created intentionally to try to play for the future versus the present. The second that they put Josh Allen onto that field is the second that the rebuild has to take a slight backseat to developing the team and playing to win. Because the second that Josh Allen hurts his elbow and you pray to God it's not serious and it's not a UCL, it's not Tommy John, what what if that is? What what if he has to have that surgery and he's out for a year and a half? What if he doesn't suit up for the entire next season? Is the rebuild still in form? Is the rebuild still what we thought it was going to be? Is the rebuild still valid if the number one move they make, they put all their eggs in the Josh Allen basket, he comes in, throws for two touchdowns, runs for three, and then gets hurt and doesn't play this season? Broken. Is it worth it? It, it? Is the rebuild already failed before it began? The move, to, the move that they made to get the quarterback was v- highly questionable at the time, and it looks even more reason to question it now. With hindsight, fuck it. I've got all the hindsight I need. <laughs> you spent quite a bit of draft capital to take a quarterback, like Jeff said, that was the rawest of all the quarterbacks. Even even, even kind of cost you Cordy Glenn. They had to trade up to get to 12. Mm-hmm. To, to then be able to trade move up. up to 7. Mm-hmm. So, and, man, that offensive line just looks great. I'm glad mm-hmm. we did that. I mean, Dawkins is... Okay. You can't, ex- but it's not Cordy can't, Glenn. You can't <laughs> no. control Wood, and you can't control Incognito. Correct. I get that, but but you didn't. You they didn't even have, have a play. Now. They didn't even have legitimate backups for yeah. these guys. It is a ballsy move to follow up two uncontrollable things about your offensive line by a controllable thing with your true. offensive line. I was say, I was saying today um, to somebody that you know, if you want to, everyone on Twitter, who do you blame? Do you blame McDermott? Do you blame Bean? You blame the I mean, players. You, can you blame one without the other? I mean, it's it's a no, cohesive unit. No, they're, if you want, but if you want, totally to, I think together. you want to put blame. If you want to really blame someone and deny the fact that you're in an actual rebuild. Is you should blame Brandon Bean for not fixing the holes on the offensive line, for not acquiring a decent receiver for Allen to throw to. You know that that's even he went out and added better, like, good players to an already good defense. Uh, it's a part of the team that didn't need attention. And avoided the tension on the offensive side that was really struggling. If they I think don't, that if, was, I think if it, they don't use this offseason almost entirely on the offense, I want Bean out. But they if, have to. They have to use this offseason for the offense. Yeah, I mean the defense at least has. You have guys like Milano, Trey White. But if Poyer they're drafting in the top and five and they take a defensive end, because because Nick Bosa's there, that would be that tough doesn't to make sense. That would be a terrible move, and, and that would be grounds for. Uh, I could one hundred percent see. Fired. I could one hundred percent see McBean doing that, though. Tell me yeah, that they would give me the best player. They'd give you the best player. Best player available. available. He was on our board. I mean, when they took White, that was a bit of a surprise, just because at the time it seemed like they were okay at cornerback. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, turns out it worked. No, that no one bats zero. No, no one bats zero. Nobody bats. No one bats a thousand. Yeah. You're hoping that you're going to land somewhere in the 500 range and right now I've yet to see an offensive player that they've scouted or traded for or any yeah even Charles Clay that they signed away from Miami he's but not, I mean that was not been good I'm just talking about this current regime sure and like the mo- the most painful part of that argument you you read that quote in the open from mm-hmm. McDermott today is this a running football team Josh Allen leads this team in rushing touchdowns with three that offense this point of the season. This is not a running football team. That offense is not in anything. It, it's, it's not a running team. It's not a passing team. Like they're to say that our identity is that we're Buffalo. This is a running football team. They want is their. It, they is want it demonstrably that to be their, a running team. They right. want that to be their identity. Well, it doesn't mean right. it actually I, is. I heard their identity today is based on old weather patterns. I heard today that the, <laughs> the Bills have had seventy six first and ten plays. Ten of them have been a pass. How far does how is, global warming have to go before Buffalo can be a fucking passing team? It's just, how warm does the earth have to get before we can draft a wide receiver who can catch the ball more than 10 yards from the line of scrimmage? Like, what do we have to do? Like, just because we're born in a cold climate means we have to watch Patrick Mahomes go absolutely bananas a in another dome, apparently. Sunday night primetime game. It is painful to watch other football. And, I, Steve, I know you were in the same boat with me. I turned on the Red Zone channel midway through. I had it on in the background. I yep. 
flipped it over to it immediately. Yep. Second quarter, I was out of that game. For halfway through the first, I made it, and I was on the red zone. And I play too much fantasy football yep. to watch that lousy team, and I much more fun to watch red zone. Yeah. When, and, man, it feels like crap to watch. Even the shitty teams with young quarterbacks, the, the Browns trying to figure it out with Mayfield, the Jets having their struggles with Darnold, like, at least they throw the ball. At least they're teams that are forward thinking and trying to do something. It is Well, you need your receivers to do something. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's the passing game is the problem is on all ends. It is, but even when Allen's throwing the ball forty yards downfield to someone who got forty yards downfield, he's been overthrowing him by ten yards. There's just or under throwing him by ten. Yeah, it's it's everyone and everything, and more than it's everyone and everything. The frustrating part for me is that it's the coaching staff. The mentality of the coach is not that we should fix how we pass the ball, which if you want to be a good team, and going back to where we started. The best passing teams in the league in terms of efficiency, it's the Vikings, it's the Chiefs, it's the Rams, it's the Saints. And what do those teams all have in common? If the season ended today, all of those teams would be in the playoffs. And all of those teams would be viewed as legitimate threats to win a Super Bowl. And I have the top 30 passing yardage leaders in the NFL on my phone, and there are zero Buffalo Bills. C.J. Beathard, who's played for like three games, is in there. Marcus Mariota missed a couple of games. He's in there. Ryan well, Fitzpatrick played for three games. He's in there. Well, didn't we Anderson have, zero. have Didn't Anderson have the most yards of a Bills quarterback in the game this season? Yeah, he almost two hundred. At one point, one seventy five. At one point, it was forty for seventeen, like hundred something yards. And... Yeah, and I'm I'm glad that the culture that ran Tyrod Taylor out because he couldn't throw for three hundred yards in a game. And felt the need that we had to get a quarterback to the point that we drafted Josh Allen. Is now yeah, trying to get, no, we're now yards, gonna, well, yeah, we're we're going to defend Allen because he's young. This quarterback team is a fucking absolute. It's the worst quarterback room in a modern NFL history, and I don't think that is overstating it. There is no one here, and it's not that it's it's not a team that had an injured guy. It's not a team that just had like someone didn't pan out. There is no talent. No arm talent in that quarterback room right now. And maybe Allen can have it in the future. It does not exist right now. Mm -hmm. There is zero. Anyway. Um, you need to play in a cold climate. It's going to be awesome when Allen comes back playing in a very cold game, throwing a cold ball to receivers with cold hands. <laughs> they're not going to catch anything. But he's, if, if, but he gets, you know, if he gets it near from them. From Wyoming, he's a mountain boy. He's ready for those cold games. Well, I'm saying the receivers aren't going to be able to catch those balls. If he's slinging them the way he does, he puts no touch on any pass. You remember that pass he threw in his first game to Clay from like five yards away where he just absolutely like lasered it and Clay like dropped it immediately yeah. like, like he wasn't expecting it? Just imagine that, but also everything is cold and hurts. They're never going to catch anything. If, if, he, if he gets it near them, they're not going to catch it. They're going <laughs> to hit their hands and drop, fall off. So Kyle Benjamin looked but, okay yesterday for a little I mean, bit. Him and Familiarity with like, Anderson, yeah. yeah. It's that Carolina connection that we keep relying on. He was just throwing it in tight spots, which is nice to see until they were picked off. Yeah, I mean, not, not everything he did was terrible. A lot of it was terrible, but he made a couple nice throws. And it, it I mean, maybe we'll see a little bit more from him this week yeah, because that's his first the, game back two weeks ago. He was the on vacation with his kids. Mm -hmm. I just felt really bad for him. I felt I felt bad watching it. Like I turned it off because like I just felt. Was it you in the Maybe. slack that's like, this guy looks like he wants to be a million miles away from where yeah. he currently is? I said that he had a look at his face like I was on vacation two weeks ago, and that was way cooler. <laughs> I was in Aruba. <laughs> now I'm here. Did they? Do you guys think that the defense had an off game, or are they just tired of the shit? It was uh, an off. It was. Are they, as, as a unit, just exhausted of like both? Well, like when Clay when Clay fumbled that ball, that was kind of the crumbling point. And you you would yeah. not, I would not blame the defense one minute if they weren't like son of a oh, bitch. The tackling, like come the, on, the tackling like, ceased. Yeah. I didn't see the effort. Right. I they didn't get us. It's the first game in the Sean McDermott era that they didn't register a turnover or a sack. They got so, neither. Right. Vic Rucci said on a post game interview a very alarming a very alarming stat to him that there were zero assisted tackles, which means no one else is coming to the ball. Hmm. No, you know, that's no. and that's been that's been their mo the start of the season is everybody's getting to the ball. They're gang tackling. And that defense is passed walking to the so. locker room after the Texas game. They and it mm -hmm. didn't. It got much worse. I mean, I, I just they played I, well against Colts until that fumble from Clay. I look at the teams up there. I mean, it was zero zero until at the end of the first quarter. Yep. I think that they lost to the second best quarterback that they played this year. Um, I think the best quarterback that they're playing is calling him out on social media coming next Monday. <laughs> Does he ever do that? By the way, what the fuck? That's no, weird. that was great. <laughs> oh my god! It just. I, I I don't think Brady's ever. I'm not even mad. That his was entire career. That was hilarious because you knew what the reaction was going to be. Let's get this asshole. Like, all right, well, why don't you go throw another dildo on the field and see if that fixes right. it? 
you know like it was just it was perfect pitch perfect the, bill, the bills him. have tried it too like booby dixon when um uh goskowski was warming up for field goals he ran out on the field and kicked the ball off the tee on goskowski <laughs> and it's like yeah we're the tough guy they got trounced like 41 to 7 was like that a rex ryan game oh of course and yeah. yeah and it's like you think that like people are all pissed off at tom brady he's not wrong like yeah. he's like yeah i'm about to roll into buffalo and leave six and two yeah people are like fuck you except he's right so you're a cheater <laughs> five rings <laughs> the bills come out and just upset him Oh, it would be the greatest. I'm, I'll be there. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'm going to be there, too. Yeah. Be the best yeah. Sounds like McCoy's not yeah. playing. We're, we're, are we even going to let ourselves get into this train of thought? Like, no. obviously, first of all, it would be amazing. I would Justin love every it. single second of it. But it's just, this just has the, the making I didn't suggest them winning, just to be clear. The, oh, yeah. No, I know. He said that. I think they're going to get I trounced. They win. I the, think they're going to lose 39 to the zero. So the defense has to play a combined game of what they played against Minnesota and Green Bay, where you're causing the turnovers, getting the pressure on the quarterback, and containing all of the various offensive weapons that you have. Mm -hmm. Much, much, much easier said than done. Right. But they've done that. They've, I mean, not they've, entirely impossible. They have feasible. picked six Brady, and that was the only touchdown they scored, and they still lost like 21 to 7. Um, I just, some, I don't know what to do with the offense. Creativity. I don't know. Just try something different. That's all we ask. What can you do? The guy's been here for two. For two That's and what a half I'm saying. I don't, I don't know. Like it was I'm last week on the show, like the off the off is more creative in the preseason than it is now. It's weird. Because McCarron could run more of it than Anderson could. I'm glad Maybe. we traded him for a fifth round pick. Again, Blaine Bean. I don't know what the offense does. Put Peterman in the backfield and pitch it to him and then try and let him throw it from there because maybe he can see things differently. I can Ray Ray McClellan play quarterback? Let's find out. Just if you have any the trick plays, team. if you have anything, triple option, oh, right? <laughs> Seriously, if you have Wish anything balling. in your arsenal, throw it out here because you're on. It's your one national television game this year. You're playing your arch rival at home. The crowds, the atmosphere will be fun for a little while. <laughs> Don't <laughs> then they'll kick the ball off for saying, the opening kickoff. Like Cordell you know, Patterson, ninety nine yards. Tennessee right. hosted Alabama earlier this week mm -hmm. and I think it was twenty eight nothing Alabama after the first quarter. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> Go out in a blaze of glory. Top. Yeah. Just like Do what yeah. you did against Dallas a couple of years or ten years ago when you were actually beating them and like was it George Wilson with the pick six and then Dan Bailey missed what the field goal to win and they called timeout and they gave him another chance what, and he made what it. What was that? What uh Roma had what, five interceptions yeah. that game or something? Yeah. That was the last uh that was the last primetime game in Buffalo, correct? Non -Thursday. Last Monday night. Non Thursday night. Sorry, last yes. Monday night. So yeah, yes. that's the point. Just try something different other than yeah. what you're doing right calling, now. Calling what? my one shot now. Yeah. Their first play, the Bills are running on offense, is a flea flicker that will be intercepted. I like it. Didn't they try to run a flea flicker they the did. first play a few they weeks did. ago? Oh. I honestly I've been tuning you're out correct. of so many games I don't even know. Josh Allen. It was first out play. <laughs> Suit it up. With a bionic arm. I was just surprised they start, They named Anderson and started, started today because yeah. they were saying how he was walking around with a noticeable limp after the game. I thought like, oh, I'll take a noticeable limp over whatever Peterman has. <laughs> Prime time Peterman. Peterman just doing jumping jacks, running calisthenics. Remember people thought he was going to start the second half. <laughs> Everybody lost their mind. Yeah, well, well, well Tim Graham tweeted was throwing, about it. Yeah. He was throwing. Anderson had the ball cap on. Like it. That is a sign. That's, I thought, that was but. the universal put me in, coach. I'm ready. I can bring us back from the brink. I got this. All right, John Fogarty, let's do this. Put you in, coach. It was as yeah, it was bad. I don't think I'm gonna watch the game. I don't know. Well, the, well the Peterman was throwing there, the ball so. on the sidelines and it was probably intercepted and they changed their minds. <laughs> can right. Allen throw better left handed than Peterman right handed? That's a Serious very questions. good question. He's very strong. Big hands. Or shorts. Huge hands. Great in shorts. I can't wait. I'm going to a wedding in Colorado in November, and we're about 45 minutes from the Wyoming border, and I can't wait to drive up to Laramie and breathe the air. Josh <laughs> Allen, breathe. Just to fully understand, I expect mm -hmm. that my They're gonna ring offer you size a will offer go you a up. contract. My ring will be stuck on my finger. It will go up three sizes. My hands will just become engorged. Great word, engorged. Um and yeah, and you still won't be able to see over the offensive lines. Well, numbers. not all of us can be five, six, and three quarters. All right, guys, let's wrap this up. We've been going for an hour and a half, and we appreciate those of you who stuck around and and listened and 
tuned in. Uh, we'll probably have a different schedule next week with the Bills game being on Monday. I don't think we quite decided what we're going to do for broadcasting that or doing it Tuesday or whatever we're going to do. Uh, but we will, by hook or by crook and probably several beers deep, bring you coverage of the Buffalo Bills defeat to the hands of the traitor New England Patriots. Uh, anyone else have anything else they want to go out on before we just list several forms of social media? It was a really nice how, ma- how many drinks does everybody think they'll need to get through the next week's game? I'm going to stop I'll be watching. at the game, so how many you All of them. <laughs> I'll be paying $11 a beer, so hopefully not that many. Yep. <laughs> Like, I just won my fantasy football today or this week with Tevin Coleman's touchdown, so that's what I'm excited about. I, I won a fantasy matchup with Blake Bortles as my starting quarterback. Wow, feels good. That was yeah. You better hit those stuff. plugs real fast uh, here while we discuss yep. our fantasy team. So thank y'all for listening. You can find us on Twitter at Seven One Six Sports Podcast on Facebook at Seven One Six Sport Podcast. Follow the podcast wherever you prefer to get your podcast. Podbean, Apple Podcasts on our website via our Twitter feed or live. This one actually live and recorded on Facebook.com. So you can follow along to the video and some stats that Justin had up there the whole time. You can find us on Friendster, MySpace, no longer on Google+, Plus, but we're starting a petition to resurrect it. Uh, you can follow along to our SoundCloud. You can look at this picture of Justin's Ted. I'm going to Instagram that's located above his computer. You can find us on Tumblr at 716sportspodcastgifts.tumblr.com. And we will be coming more soon. We'd like to thank Tage Thompson for taking time out of his day mm-hmm. to speak with us. A very positive, yeah, uplifting great. member of the Buffalo hockey community. That's all I got.